My name is Christina Yao, and I'm here today from the University of South Carolina, which is the occupied territory of the Congaree people. In addition, I want to acknowledge the enslaved individuals who provided exploited labor to lay the foundations that formed this university. My name is Crystal George Mwangi, and I'm a professor of higher education at George Mason University, a space that resides on the stolen land of the Manahoac people and surrounded by land that continues to be stewarded by the Piscataway Kanoi and the Monacan indigenous populations here. We're excited to be here with everyone today and a special thank you to the Critical Internationalization Studies Network for inviting us to participate in these master classes. Before we start our presentation, we do have some learning outcomes for our time together today. Today, we will discuss past patterns, current trends, and future directions for educating international students and executing education abroad. We will also explore how an emergent equity-driven internationalization lens may lead to foregrounding inequities and equities in current approaches to international student mobility and education abroad. And finally, we will offer suggestions for reframing approaches to international student mobility and education abroad research and practice with an emphasis on remaining student-centered. We also wanna make a quick caveat that as US trained scholars, our perspective is very much guided by our context and environment. We know there are many of you from different regions of the world as faculty, staff, and students. So we encourage you that as we go through this presentation, please think about how our conversation today reflects what you've seen in your individual context, especially as our research is situated within the United States. As we discuss and reflect on our topic today, Christina and I are going to use a framework that we developed recently called the Equity Driven Lens for Internationalization. We use the term research lens rather than framework because beyond shaping how researchers view or ground an issue, a lens is also able to magnify. In our case, our lens is meant to serve as a tool for magnifying equity and inequity in higher education internationalization. Our development of the lens was informed by our initial review of an analysis of extensive literature on internationalization and higher education, in which we foreground the broad concepts of equity and inequity present therein as a way to examine how these concepts were presented or missing in that body of research. In doing so, we identified four guiding principles of our lens, which was important for us to develop because while internationalization is increasingly a strategic priority in higher education, growing scholarship demonstrates that internationalization practices such as education abroad, international student recruitment, and cross-border partnerships can engender Western superiority, elitism, and hegemony. Conversely, an equity-driven lens assumes that education institutions and their processes are not neutral, and thus it's important to be intentional about putting equity at the center of our research, practice, and policy. Within our illustration, you see a piece of yarn, which we use as a metaphor for illustrating the internationalization of higher education. Yarn is typically viewed as a singular thread. Just as internationalization can often be used as a single broad umbrella term, which can overshadow its complexity. However, when looked at closer, yarn is made up of multiple strands of interlocked fibers, and internationalization also reflects the interconnectedness of multiple complex processes, practices, peoples, communities, and organizations. We developed four lenses that we discuss as magnifying internationalization and the equity or inequity present in, in that process. We've placed the four guiding principles on this slide as well for easier readability, and we'll go a little deeper into our four guiding principles or lenses by using them to organize the rest of our master class. We argue that applying an equity-driven lens to internationalization requires unpacking the underlying conceptual and theoretical perspectives, deconstructing internationalization and reconstructing it as a concept, identifying socio-historical contexts and connecting to contemporary forces of globalization. Now I'll turn things over to Christina, who will begin to contextualize the specific topic of our master class, students. We added a few slides here from Project Atlas that highlight the current state of student mobility around the world, so we have a little bit more context as we continue. As you can see, over 5.6 million students studied abroad in the 2018-2019 academic year, which includes degree-seeking students, as well as those participating in short-term or exchange programs. The top host countries remain the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada, with China and India remaining the top sending countries, all of which have been consistent for many years. 
We also want to note that the data from this year does not provide a full picture of student mobility in China, likely due to the COVID-19 pandemic starting at the end of 2018. So the first graphic in this next slide shows the differences between 2000 and 2020 in host destinations. So in 20 years, we've seen an increase of 4 million more students studying abroad, and we can see some changes in the host destinations, such as China emerging as the fourth most popular destination, despite not even being listed 20 years prior. On the second graphic, we can see the change in host destinations in just one year. Canada, Australia, and the Netherlands were the destinations with the highest increase in hosting students, while we see several drops, including the US, which for years has been lauded as being the top destination. So we have to ask the question, what causes these changes that we've seen over the past several years? How do politics and economics affect student choice? Overall, we know that there are many push-pull pressures that affect student choice for studying abroad. These two slides from Project Atlas give us a quick glance at the current state of global student mobility from which we can make assumptions about student choice for location. And now we'll delve a little bit deeper into our four guiding principles to approach both research and practice on student mobility and education abroad from an equity-driven perspective. So the first lens we will cover is defining the socio-historical context. From a global perspective, most nation states, including the United States, have always been sites of internationalization, globalization, colonization, and domination of people, lands, and ideas. We argue that current research cannot be divorced from social and historical events and ideologies that continue to inform contemporary approaches to international education research and practices. We believe that scholars and practitioners can pursue equitable approaches to internationalization research by considering socio-historical contexts and how these contexts serve as foundations for current internationalization research and strategies. We suggest using the socio-historical context guiding principle as a tool for critical knowledge production that acknowledges and engages with the past. We must take into consideration what larger structures, systems, values, and histories are embedded in our scholarship and practice. Also, how do social, cultural, historical, racial, economic, and political factors, as well as local and world events, influence how we engage in research and practice? By engaging in such questions, scholars may approach internationalization in a way that interrogates how prior action and ideology may permeate current approaches to research and practice. We know that global student mobility has been in existence for centuries. Much of the research on international students in the US started in the 1960s and 70s, including reviews that were mostly sponsored by the US government that also did not take into consideration why students chose to study in the US. Uh, on the other hand, they primarily really focused more on adjustment to life in the US, mostly focusing on integration and assimilationist frames. But in applying a socio-historical lens to more contemporary trends in international student mobility, we can see that we've gone through several waves here in the United States. The first wave focused primarily on the increasing demand for highly skilled talent, especially in science, technology, and engineering. Thus, within this first wave, the pull for international students was to help fulfill the needs of employers within the STEM field. The second wave was highly influenced by economic needs, much of it driven by the global financial crisis. Also, this was a time when we saw the institutions of higher education were unprepared to support their international student population because most of their attention was on the recruitment aspect. So this is really when international students were starting to become becoming viewed more as financial commodities. As evidenced by the first two waves, the emphasis was really on recruiting international students primarily to benefit the United States. And the third wave was greatly affected by many global issues, including several political changes such as Brexit and the Trump presidency. So to a certain extent, we're coming out of the third wave, but in a time of great unknown due to the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic. Yet we know that based on history, international students are commodified as tools to serve the needs of national and institutional entities. And this will likely continue, especially as we move into post-pandemic times. The foundations of study abroad are attributed to the 19th century when wealthy youth would embark on a grand tour of Europe as a coming of age experience when decorum training and husband hunting was the primary focus. Hence the majority of participants were wealthy white women, which is very similar to current US education abroad demographics. After World War I, the US government invested heavily in, in, in educational exchange, most notably the Fulbright program and the passage of the Higher Education Act of 1965, which permitted higher education institutions to use federal financial aid to support study abroad. 
Study abroad programs in the U.S. grew exponentially in the 1990s and the early 2000s, leading to a professionalization of education abroad professionals and associations. Study abroad has evolved from the periphery to the center of the global curriculum as a way to promote intercultural communication and understanding. Intended benefits include peacemaking, global citizenship, national security, and economic growth. And all of these outcomes are typically used to inform current education abroad efforts. For students, education abroad is considered a high impact practice for academic success and persistence, while also preparing students to be more competitive in the job market and in their careers because they're considered more worldly and well-traveled. And in our next section, um, it's really focused on the connection to contemporary forces of globalization. Internationalization is heavily driven by global structures and systems that privilege the needs of what is considered the global north. This is especially relevant today because we push against the idea that the process of internationalization is often compartmentalized as U.S. domestic priorities that are disconnected from global issues, which we know is a disservice in current research theory and practice. Thus, researchers must take into consideration how contemporary forces of globalization affect research, policies, and practices related to international higher education. Scholars should consider some questions that interrogate the forces of globalization, such as how do local and world events impact us? And what are the economic and political factors that must be examined in internationalization research and practice? <clears throat> as we previously discussed, we know that the forces of globalization have heavily influenced international student mobility. Some examples include elections, laws, and policies, and most recently, the arrival of a global pandemic. Using the United States as an example, even in the past two years, we've seen an expansion of travel bans from predominantly Muslim countries last January. In July 2020, a policy that was later rescinded was announced that international students could not be in the U.S. and remain as fully online students, which brought a lot of feelings of trauma and insecurity. Overall, international students have become commodified as imports and exports that serve national and institutional benefits. The commodification of students reflects a response to market-driven globalization, including their positioning as a means for garnering diversity, contributing to foreign policy, producing knowledge, and generating economic gains. Overall, international students and student mobility are situated within larger systems of global domination and geopolitics, addressing the forces of globalization. So our equity-driven lens supports investigating how international students are situated within multiple geopolitical, socio-historical, and globalized economic systems and contexts. This includes international students' impact on home and host countries, the demand side motivations for student mobility, and how student mobility works to transcend and or reify global inequities. Using an equity-focused lens, scholars must go beyond simply reporting student learning outcomes, which often tends to be the emphasis when discussing education abroad, and really consider what forces are at work. The most popular programs are short-term programs and located in Western Europe, which can contribute to larger issues within a globalization context. So for example, the short time in country may lead to issues in consumerism, post-colonial practices, cultural tourism, and commodification of experiences, which may result in these trips serving as university-sponsored tourism that may be potentially damaging to the host country while simultaneously viewing the host country as the other. In addition, study abroad can lead to what Breen termed privileged migration, described as a process in which students engage temporarily with a host before returning to the normalcy of their home, while simultaneously the host countries, especially those in what is considered the global south, become dependent on those academic tourism dollars from students in education abroad programs. Overall, the proliferation of education abroad had led to more institutions and global program providers recognizing the material benefits of study abroad and has led to increased commercialization of cross-border education for financial gain. As such, contemporary forces of globalization play a very large role in the promotion of education abroad, including institutional, political, and individual student motivations. The next lens focuses on integrating equity-driven conceptual and theoretical perspectives. An equity-driven orientation guides scholars and practitioners away from grounding their work in ways that reinforce internationalization as a values-neutral or indiscriminately positive process, 
One way to counteract values neutrality is through the use of conceptual and theoretical perspectives that enable us to critique and disrupt inequity, hegemony, and marginalization that occurs in higher education internationalization, as well as to identify and engage in resistance of inequity and a reimagining of internationalization. Our equity-driven lens should not be used to replace the integration of critical epistemologies or theories or other relevant frameworks in future research. However, our lens does ask that researchers grapple with not only what internationalization means, but also how they frame problems to combat inequity. For example, when scholars make decisions in how they ground and frame their research, we suggest thinking about the following questions in that decision-making process. How does my theoretical or conceptual framework help me to foreground equity in who or what my research serves and centers? How does my perspective guide me towards literature that resists values neutral and hegemonic internationalization or supports my critique of literature that does? How does my framework inform my methodological approach and methods to embed power and inequity in choices such as research site and participant selection and how I collect, analyze, and present data? And finally, how does my conceptual or theoretical framework support my interrogation of larger structures, systems, values, and histories that internationalization is embedded within? Research on international student experiences has historically been grounded in frameworks related to assimilation and psychology, cult frameworks and constructs like culture shock and acculturative stress that focus on coping to understand international students' adjustment to their new educational environment. Yet seeking to understand these students solely using these frameworks and constructs foregrounds their behavior as maladaptive to adjustment challenges and also places the onus on the students to adapt to their environment instead of calling on higher ed institutions to transform to better support and be inclusive of their international students. Framing scholarship around what students are lacking, rather than on how they can be supported in their education environment, is problematic within an equity-driven lens. But a number of scholars are moving to scholarship that provides a more equi equity oriented approach for understanding international students, their perspectives and their educational experiences and outcomes. Some scholars are using sociological, ecological and critical frameworks to consider and critique the role of systems, structures and environments on an international students experiences. As an example, much of the early research related to international students in the US did not include issues of race and racism. And those types of issues were typically reserved for talking about American racially minoritized students. However, in an article that I co-wrote with Christina and Dr. Victoria Melanie Brown, we argued that critical race theory can be used to understand these students' experiences in the US because of the racialization and racism that they experience within and by US higher education institutions. As another example, Lee and Rice have applied the concept of neo-racism, a form of racism grounded in culture, national origin, and nation-to-nation -nation relationships, rather than solely on phenotype or physical characteristics, to demonstrate the nuanced ways that international students experience discrimination in U.S. higher education. And then other scholars have developed frameworks when current frameworks don't work. So for example, I developed with colleagues in 2014, research on the experiences of non-white foreign born students in the US and really developed a emergent framework to talk about how they experienced racial identity development, which we found was very different from racial identity development models that were US centric because these students had distinct racial understandings from their home country that informed how they experienced race and racism in the US. When it comes to study abroad, education abroad programs are often framed as high impact practices for student success and persistence, as well as a tool for learning, intercultural engagement and global citizenship development. Yet an equity driven lens would also critique education abroad for not doing more to acknowledge and dismantle structural inequities, colonial gaze and racism pre presented within international experiences. Attending to these issues simultaneously, however, can pose challenges in practice. For example, short-term education abroad opportunities can be less ex expensive for students, thus creating greater economic accessibility for them. Yet these programs have also been critiqued as cultural tourism, as Christina mentioned, that can be damaging to the host country and to students' perspectives of 
of nations around the world. Equity-driven frameworks can help in navigate, navigating some of these complexities. For example, centering an anti-deficit framework for student learning and education abroad programming and preparation for students and stakeholders involved. Additional conceptual and theoretical perspectives that have been used by scholars to understand education abroad include community cultural wealth, mutuality, decoloniality, inclusive excellence, and queer theory, which have really served to create space for not only assuming the benefits of education abroad, but towards reimagining the greater possibilities of it. The final lens focuses on constructing and deconstructing internationalization. The language used in internationalization research and the meaning ascribed to that language, whether explicitly stated or implicitly assumed, has power to shape how internationalization is understood and enacted in practice, policy, and future research. We encourage researchers and practitioners to move beyond implicit assumptions of internationalization and engage greater nuance in how it's constructed in research towards the goal of equity-driven scholarship and practice. The overarching idea is for scholars and practitioners to question who gets to decide what counts and who counts as internationalization on an individual campus or even in internationalization research, rather than accept the status quo of what's included, excluded, or defined. In doing so, we can move towards a construction of internationalization that works towards resisting rather than reifying inequity in higher education. So as Christina mentioned earlier, there are over 5.5 million international students around the world. And while much of the traditional dominant dialogue has centered on the mobility of these students from the global south to the global north, deconstructing that narrative allows us to really focus on and center the other important key trends like mobility of students from global south to global south nations and the weakening of international student enrollment and satisfaction in many global north countries as well. As another example, the sole focus on national identity of international students also often ignores student socioeconomic status, racial identity, ethnic racial identity, um, linguistic background, religious identity, sexuality, ability, and other social locations. Not acknowledging sociocultural factors and identity beyond national origin presents students as one dimensional and wrongly suggests that there can be a one size fits all approach to meeting international students educational needs. It should not be assumed that all international students share common characteristics or experiences beyond a shared student visa status. And by removing this assumption, scholars can acknowledge that international students experience multiple points of privilege and oppression given their intersecting identities at different points in time. Finally, how might we disrupt the international versus domestic kind of binary or labels that we use on students that don't take into consideration the liminal spaces that many students occupy? These binaries leave little room for acknowledging student populations who live in between because of a transnational background. Those without longstanding histories in one nation, and yet with what might be considered more permanent ties. Immigrants who become naturalized citizens, the children of immigrants, refugees, asylees, how do their experiences become less visible as we construct student demographic labels in overly simplistic or narrow ways? When it comes to education abroad, the question of who can participate is key in, in deconstructing whether and how education abroad programs are promoted to all college students. Thus, it's important to think about the ways in which we can deconstruct who engages in these experiences, particularly in nations where it's not a requirement to go abroad and there are not structural resources to support it. This starts with considering the structural challenges, whether real or assumed by students who may not see themselves as someone who should go abroad. Lack of information, financial constraints, and familial or community responsibilities can all be barriers, and students are not always aware of how to navigate those things or who to go to and feel comfortable asking about them, particularly when staff running the programs don't share the same social locations or experiences. <clears throat> 
We can also deconstruct what is considered the value of education at broad locations. Are education abroad sites in the global north being positioned as places for study and research? And education abroad sites in the global south being positioned as places to go do service and volunteerism? How does this reify the privileging of knowledge, values, cultures, and communities writ large? And what message does it send to students with heritages from these locales? But it's not all about access. It's also about the deconstructing of experiences abroad. Sometimes internationalization practice, there's this notion of doing good, that it's ultimately positive, and we just have to get students on board to go abroad. But as we've discussed here, these practices can reinforce oppression, marginalization, and hegemony on many levels. For underrepresented students, this reflects the othering that they may experience abroad, and that this othering may show up differently because identities are socially constructed and shift with transnational flows and mobility. Thus, it's really important to deconstruct what privilege is and what marginalization is as not static nor singular experiences or constructs. And at the same time, it's important to reconstruct the practice of education abroad for what it can be and what might be hidden. Sometimes there can be a narrow narrative of education abroad as a pastime for the privilege, a vacation while in college. And it's important for us to disrupt that narrative as well, because foremost historical and contemporary thought leaders have spent their time as college students abroad. And many of these individuals have built alliances with others around the globe, linking the fight for domestic, civil, and human rights with a vision for for international civil and human rights and have made it an amazing contribution to our societies. So how can we really center on the transformative, mutual and collaborative elements of education abroad as we move into the future? Now that we've gone through and applied our four lenses, we wanted to come back to the main visual to remind you that while our lenses are about magnifying issues of inequity, it's also about magnifying issues of equity. We do not think that international student mobility or education abroad are all bad, and our lenses also re represent the importance of critical reflection and critical hope. We provide a number of questions as you consider and continue to deconstruct and reconstruct international student mobility and education abroad in your own work as a way of encouraging your own process of critical reflection, hope, and action moving forward. So when considering the socio-historical context affecting international student mobility and education abroad, we invite researchers and practitioners to consider the following questions as they engage in an equity-driven approach. In what larger structures, systems, values, and histories is the internationalization practice that is being examined embedded? How do social, cultural, historical, racial, economic, and political factors, as well as local and world events, influence how internationalization is enacted? And then finally, how do socio-historical events and context affect and inform the approach to research and practice? As we discussed previously, taking into consideration how contemporary forces of globalization affect students is critical. These forces drive so much of how higher education operates and affects the decisions that students make to study abroad. So some questions to consider include, what are the social, cultural, historical, and racial implications of the research topic and approach? How do local and world events impact how internationalization is discussed and researched? What are the economic and political factors that must be examined in higher education, internationalization, research, and practice? When engaging in work related to international student mobility and education abroad, we encourage researchers and practitioners to consciously consider the ways they're framing these issues whether through formal theory and frameworks or whether through personal reflections on the ways in which your own socialization experiences, biases and values can impact the way you see these issues. Make sure to consider how your theoretical or conceptual frameworks help to foreground equity and who or what your research or practice serves and centers, how these frameworks embed power and equity into choices that inform your research and practice, and how they support the integration of larger structures, systems, values, and histories that internationalization is embedded within. And finally, we remind you to not take current buzzwords like internationalization for granted. Think about the meaning of these constructs that you use and deconstruct the ways that power and equity flow through them while also moving towards how they might be reconstructed with equity at the center. Specific questions to guide you in that direction include, how, what does it mean to use constructs like domestic, 
international, global, and local in an equity-driven internationalization based framing, research, practice, and policy. How might the use of these types of dichotomous language limit our understanding of the complex nature of internationalization and the students embedded within? And who and what is it excluded in internationalization practice policy and research when these constructs we use are not inclusive or equity conscious. Christina and I would like to thank you for taking the time to watch our masterclass. We encourage you to read the, some of the additional resources that we've provided to the conveners of this program to supplement the content we've discussed here. We wish you the best in your work and hope that we've shared things that will help make a positive impact in supporting it.